Hello, I'm Dr. Ira Nash. Welcome to Well Said. Today, we'll be discussing low back pain. Millions of Americans suffer from it, and it can be incredibly disabling, preventing people from participating in everything from sports to their daily activities. But what exactly is low back pain and what causes it? And what can we do to find relief? To address these and other questions, I'm delighted to have on the show my colleague, Dr. Frank Schwab. Dr. Schwab is the chair of the Department of Orthopedic Surgery at Lenox Hill Hospital, as well as the vice president of Western Region Orthopedics and the system chief of orthopedic spine surgery for Northwell Health. He's also a professor of orthopedic surgery at the Zucker School of Medicine, and I'm delighted to have him on the show. Frank, welcome to Well Said. Thank you very much, Ira. Pleasure to be here. So I have made it my habit to ask my guests post-pandemic how they fared in the pandemic and how they're doing now. So how are you? I must say it is wonderful to be coming out of the not just the pandemic, but even the post-pandemic, um, where I think uh, we are back to a new routine, but uh, wonderful to be able to get close to our patients again and uh, to be able to provide uh, excellent care. And I must say that, uh, you know, at Northwell and Atlantic Hill, uh, we've gotten really busy again. We have a busy teaching program, so that's important, but just wonderful to be back doing all the good things we do at Northwell. Okay, terrific. All right. So I promised our listeners we were going to talk about low back pain. And at the risk of asking an obvious question, you know, what is low back pain? Well, it's pain in the lower back. I mean, I want to start by having you describe the symptoms that patients come to you with when they are when they say, I have low back pain. What does that really mean? It means lots of different things and patients do present in many different ways. So while it gets lumped into low back pain, for some patients, it's specific activity that triggers pain or discomfort somewhere about the waistline in the lower back area. For others, it's a constant dull nagging pain that's kind of always there and finally gets bothersome enough that they seek care. And for others, again, it's severe pain of somewhat recent onset that can be pretty disabling. And then there are many different uh, flavors to it. For some people, again, it is uh, vocal. Others, it is regional. It can extend a little bit higher up into the back, sometimes the whole back area, even up to the neck. And in some cases, it travels to the buttocks, and in some cases, further down the leg. And then often we call that sciatica or pain down the leg in the area of the sciatic nerve. So low back pain is lots of different things. It's not just sort of one discrete uh, set of symptoms. Millions of people seem to suffer from back pain at one time or another. Do you have any idea just how common this truly is? It's extremely common. And if we look at some of the reported statistics, um, one number that I often uh, tell my patients about or when I'm speaking with our residents is 80 to 85 percent. So 80 to 85 percent of adults in the United States will at some point have severe back pain that's rather limiting or disabling. So that's a oh, pretty wow. high number. That means that means pretty much everyone's going to get some episode, at least one episode of pretty severe back pain. Now, those that have ongoing issues of recurrent back pain is probably about 50 to 60 percent. That means you'll have several episodes where your back's really bothering a fair amount. So that's a really high number. And if we look at visits to primary care physicians, you know, back complaints are in the top five in some studies. It's the second most common reason to see a doctor. Very, very common, unfortunately. Actually, it's so common that I'm not sure my next question makes much sense, but I'll go ahead anyway, which is who's at most risk for suffering from low back pain? But I guess you're about to tell me almost anybody is. Well, right. Uh, I guess that's one way of seeing it, that just about anybody. But there are some risk factors. We're starting to understand better what seems to precipitate recurring back pain in certain patients. And I think the first category is probably... No matter what you do, you're at some point going to get some, some amount of back pain. But those who seem to be at elevated risk, unfortunately, a fair amount of this is, is genetic. It's what you've inherited from your parents. And then there are the environmental factors. And, and that has to do mostly with regular activity, fitness level, sometimes uh, work habits. So we do know that certain um, professions uh, are associated with much more back pain. And those tend to be uh, truck drivers, a lot of you know, compressive forces for many hours of sitting uh, across the, the lower back. Um, people who are in heavy lifting and working environments, people where there's lots of vibration. So an obvious one is someone who works on a, with a jackhammer. So vibrational, ongoing, intense vibrational 
activity is a risk factor. And then there are many others, but I think those are the most obvious. So the big category is you can't control the genetics and, and you mm-hmm. inherit your back, but the environment does play a role. And by staying fit and exercising regularly and avoiding those repetitive compressive forces, you, you can stack the odds a little bit in your favor. What about obesity? Yeah, there's been a lot of research on that. And some studies think uh, there is an association. Uh, others have removed that as a big risk factor. I think it is probably more a factor of fitness than necessarily overall weight or BMI. And there are some very slender, low BMI patients that come in with disabling back pain. And so again, I think weight may play a role, but it is not a dominant role. That's interesting. So since it is so common, I guess patients face a challenge even before they get to you, which is when is this serious enough that I need to seek medical attention? I'd like you to speak to that. Back pain in most cases is a quality of life issue. It is very rare that back pain is truly completely disabling or life-threatening um, or uh, uh, going to be uh, a, a, such, a, such a dominant impact on someone's ability to function and live. However, uh, uh, low back pain can be disabling enough, as we spoke about earlier, that it will affect uh, your ability to enjoy life and may affect your ability to do certain things or sports or even some work activities. And I would say um, an important uh, indicator when you should see a physician for your back pain is when it is starting to affect your quality of life, your ability to work. Now, there are also some of these red flags, as we call them. So if you have back pain and it's severe, and maybe associated with fevers, maybe associated with weight loss, maybe associated with pain um, that is not resolving or not uh, calmed down with over-the-counter medication, rest and heat, and it's persistent, then, then that certainly should prompt consultation by a physician. The other category are the neurological symptoms, meaning nerve-related symptoms. So back pain, but now with also severe pain traveling down the leg, or back pain with some weakness in the leg or in the foot, or back pain associated with some loss of control of bowel and bladder function. Those are all serious things that require prompt and immediate attention. But for most people, again, low back pain um, does not involve these serious things, and, and in most cases is rather benign. So I don't want to draw attention to thinking that back pain is always serious and always something that's going to require seeing a doctor. No, I think that was great. So if we take for a moment those situations where there are none of those red flags, uh, none of those neurological symptoms or, or other accompanying things going on, what would your advice be to somebody to just ride it out? Or what should people do on their own if they don't have the kind of back pain that you just described that really should push them to medical uh, evaluation? I think, again, because back pain is so common and, again, is mostly really uh, benign, even if annoying, is the first approach is is usually some over-the-counter medication, making sure that you have an allergy to them, that you can tolerate them, that you don't have side effects. So, So making sure you know your medical history, that it's safe, to take certain medication, but starting with uh, uh, over-the-counter anti-inflammatories is usually a first step. The other- So we're talking like a drug like Motrin or Aleve or something like that? Exactly, yeah, ibuprofen, yeah. Um, Mm -hmm. The the next step, and this sounds sounds a little counterintuitive, is actually to move. Most patients Mm -hmm. of back pain tend to think, and this would be logical to say, wow, my back's pretty sore and kind of achy. I'm just going to take it easy today and sit around and maybe not do a lot. And actually, there's a fair amount of science that's coming out and some good clinical work showing that regular activity not only can help with these milder and not severe episodes of back pain, but can also play a role potentially in preventing a recurrence. And so uh, what I recommend to most patients is Simple stuff. Don't go to the gym if your back hurts, but go for a nice walk. You don't have to walk Hmm. fast, maybe a slow walk. But what walking does is it increases blood flow to the muscles. It it gets the muscle to 
to contract lightly, but also relax with each step. You contract, relax, contract, relax. And that's actually really good for the back. Um, and in most cases, just taking some over-the-counter medication, going for walks, maybe a heating pad, a nice long hot shower in the evening is usually all that it takes. Excellent. Okay, so let's say somebody does that and pain persists or they had one of those warning signs or, or complicating factors that you uh, discussed earlier, or maybe it's just because the pain itself is so disabling that they decide to seek medical attention. Who should they see? For some people, the easiest way to get evaluated is to see your primary care doctor. But in some cases, the primary care doctor either may not be easily available or accessible. Um, and in that case, I think many people, if it's mild, again, mild, may start directly with some physical therapy. Others, mm -hmm. if they can't see their primary care doctor, may see um, a specialist. Now, we as spines, but I'm a spine surgeon, right? So I see a lot of patients that come and see me and they don't need surgery. And it's perfectly fine that I see them and evaluate them and, and put them on a good track. And I think that's fine as well. But it would be preferable to see a primary care physician. I think that's usually the first step, unless it's really rather mild. And in that case, direct access to a physical therapist is also a really good idea. So let's continue to play this out. Somebody sees a doctor, they start conservative treatment with uh, some exercise, maybe some physical therapy. I think a question that's on a lot of people's minds is when do they need to get an imaging study, an x-ray or an MRI to see, quote unquote, see what's going on there? Imaging, whether it's x-ray or MRI, or in some cases we still get CAT scans, is based upon a combination of of the symptoms and the duration, and also any associated neurologic symptoms that I mentioned earlier, pain traveling down to the leg or weakness or, or a lack of control of bowel or bladder function, those should prompt further evaluation. Often we start with an x-ray, which gives a good amount of information on the shape of the spine, the shape of the vertebrae, the spacing or the distances between the bones, which can be an indicator uh, of a back problem. But if there are neurologic symptoms, it's very common for us to get an MRI because the MRI will additionally show us the nerve structures and the soft tissue structures that we can't see on an X-ray. So that would be a good reason to get an MRI. Nerve symptoms or severe persistent back pain uh, or any weakness, um, uh, any bowel or bladder dysfunction. So those would be indicators to get enhanced imaging. But just to turn that coin to the other side for a moment. So what you're saying, I think, is that for most people who have kind of run-of-the-mill, achy back, none of those other neurological symptoms, it doesn't sound like imaging is either indicated or of much help. I think that's fair to say. Yeah, I think that the concern is, A, it's not necessary, B, it's costly, and, and C, uh, sometimes when we do these tests and they're not really uh, based on significant symptoms, we'll find little things here and there, and, and that may create anxiety or over-treatment, as we're learning a lot of areas of medicine where maybe over-diagnosing and over-treating. And so I think it's fair to say that an MRI should be reserved for those cases um, where there's a good reason to suspect something more serious going on that we may want to treat, and we need those images to really see things um, in their full extent. Um, but, but it is not a screening tool. I would never recommend an MRI for everyone who has back pain. Yeah, my understanding is that if you were to just do MRIs on a lot of people, you'd end up seeing a lot of stuff that may look like it's causing symptoms, but the correlation between what you see anatomically and what people are feeling isn't really all that great. Is that right? That's exactly it. You hit the nail on the head. So if we take an MRI on 100 people walking down the street, let's say in their 50s, who have no back problems whatsoever, 50% of them at least would have an abnormal MRI. So what that tells us is that that's, that's, that's a whopping number. And right. what it tells us is that the MRI is very good at looking at lots of details in the anatomy of our bodies. But it does not tell us whether that's normal, abnormal, part of normal aging, whether it's concerning or not concerning. And so um, 
just having an abnormal MRI certainly doesn't mean you have anything concerning going on or that anything specific needs to be done. So I think we need to be cautious, A, in when we get MRIs, and B, how we interpret them and then use them to guide treatment. Okay, so let's start talking a little bit about treatment. You mentioned a couple of things early on, heat, exercise, over-the-counter uh, anti-inflammatory drugs, the ibuprofen, Motrin, Aleve kind of drugs, and physical therapy. Are all of those things kind of done at once? Is there an order to these things? What's your thought about that? Um, so a lot of it will depend, again, on, on the symptoms, and I think a lot of it is based on, on the patient. So there are patients who are averse to taking medication or concerned or may have allergies or have perfectly good reasons why they shouldn't be taking um, an over-the-counter anti-inflammatory. They may have GI issues or um, uh, other medical conditions. So, so I think there are cases where those medications are not appropriate. I think physical therapy generally is a safe and very reasonable approach for, for relatively uh, uh, benign or mild uh, uh, back pain. Um, for those patients who, who have no reason not to take an anti-inflammatory or are willing to take it, I think trying everything together is a really good idea. Um, some yeah. therapy, some heat, sometimes massage, the oral medication we talked about. So really kind of trying all that. And as I mentioned, a good walking program, you know, uh, limiting your lifting, twisting, and, and over vigorous exercise and kind of babying your back a little bit, but, but certainly staying active. I want to drill down on the physical therapy for a second because I've personally heard conflicting things about what we're trying to accomplish with physical therapy. And, and maybe it, just to simplify this a little bit, are we talking about ways to kind of stretch out the muscles in, in the back, or are we talking about things that strengthen and build up the back? I think in an episode of more significant back pain that prompts a patient to seek care and then to say, well, I want to try the physical therapy, the therapy, I think, can play two really important roles. One is learning good body mechanics and making the patient more aware of how to move, what positions to avoid and what positions are, are fine to to protect their back a bit and uh, to make them more comfortable and more functional. The second part, of course, is, is the exercise part, where having an expert guide you in how to recruit and use certain muscles, A, may help you get more comfortable in the near term, but importantly, if you stick with it, as I mentioned earlier, can be protective in the long run in reducing the likelihood of you having another episode of back pain um, and other studies say, even if it doesn't always avoid it, it can mitigate or reduce the intensity of back pain in the future by staying in a regular exercise program. So I think physical therapy can be very helpful in that context. Now, I think the flip side is going and seeing a physical therapist doesn't assure you that your back pain will be cured or that it's a miracle mm -hmm. cure. Absolutely not. But it can still be an important part in getting you on the path to recovery. Are there exercises or habits that people should adopt just kind of universally as good for your back and helping to avoid low back pain issues? The back's complex, so lo lots of different muscles that need to interact. And I think one shouldn't think of the back in isolation when we think of back health, but the back as part of our sort of our torso, sort of that envelope of tissues and muscles that support our trunk are all important. And so when we think of, well, what should I be doing or what might be ideal to, to, to reduce my chance of having uh, back pain, it's, it's strengthening the whole torso. And so that's some abdominals, it's some of the lateral muscles, the muscles on the side, it's the muscles in the back. Um, so it's a combination of all of those. And there are many exercises that target various muscles around the torso that can help give us a stronger trunk and with that a stronger back and help us avoid these episodes of severe back pain. So that's the, the, the kind of core strengthening that physical therapists and trainers talk about all the time? Yeah, and core strengthening, some of it is very structured and seems really boring because someone gives you these scripted exercises, but there are a lot of activities that we can do that maintain 
strength and fitness of the core. It might be dancing, it might be swimming, it might be a combination of going to the gym once in a while or doing some floor exercises at home, a good walking program, as I mentioned earlier. So there are lots of different things that, that can help strengthen the core. So we've talked about preventive measures, uh, sort of conservative measures, some interventions with heat, medications, and so on. You're a spine surgeon. At some point, I guess there are a group of individuals for whom these things don't work or don't work well enough to restore them to functionality, and then you operate. So what kinds of procedures are you doing to relieve people of their back pain? Um, We haven't touched so much on it, but uh, the lower back is a really complicated structure. And often people think, well, gee, if I have a problem, why don't they go and fix that part? Now, Mm -hmm. the back is very different from, uh, let's say, hip or the knee or the shoulder, where um, we think of uh, uh, treatments as being completely curative. Um, Someone has a really bad hip, well, gee, we can replace that hip. Um, someone has a bad shoulder, we can replace that shoulder. Someone you know, damaged their kneecap, or well, we can do arthroscopic surgery. And there are a lot of really good treatments and really good procedures to target those specific um, uh, joints. The spine, the lower back, unfortunately, is pretty complicated. So the lower back alone has five vertebrae and five discs and 10 little joints. Now, a myriad of muscles that have to control the, the, the position and the displacement of our trunk that all cross in that area. So it becomes really, really complex. But uh, to answer your question, patients who come and then ultimately require surgery um, sometimes come because the problem is their disc. Sometimes it may be the joint. In some cases, uh, it, it's the muscle. Um, so many different structures in the lower back may get to the patient to a point where they require treatment and sometimes surgery, but that surgery uh, will depend very much upon, again, which structure is causing the trouble. And therefore, there are many different procedures that we employ to treat patients who have really pretty disabling back pain that doesn't respond to anything else. Thank you for that explanation. It sounds like your tailoring your surgical approach to the specific problem, which makes a lot of sense. But if I can try to get you to engage in some generalities here, two questions about that is, uh, are you, like other surgical fields, um, moving towards less invasive approaches to doing these procedures? And what kind of outcomes can people expect if they get to the point where they're having a surgical procedure to fix a specific problem with their back. Absolutely, we're moving to much less invasive procedures than many years ago. So much smaller openings. Sometimes we do things with small tubes uh, and um, uh, a microscopic visualization so that we get to a very targeted area to treat just that. Um, and, and there are many procedures now where patients go home the same day or, or the next morning um, from surgeries that we do to treat their spines. Um, the, the procedures may range from, uh, and here's a very common one, as a herniated disc. Um, and that's a procedure where um, we just put a little tube down into that area. We can get great visualization, remove um, a fragmented piece of, of disc. Um, and those patients usually go home the same day, sometimes the next morning. And I would say the success rate there is over 90%, probably 95% of patients feel a whole lot better um, once you treat that. There are other procedures where one may have to do a fusion where one needs to stabilize an unstable portion of the spine. And those procedures we can also do with much less invasive approaches, very small openings. Um, And uh, those patients will usually stay one or two, sometimes three nights in the hospital because we want to make sure they get enough physical therapy, that they feel they're really on the mend before they go home. We also have a really high success rate if it's done for the right reasons. And I think that's where some people feel, well, gee, fusion sounds scary because I heard it doesn't always work. I would say that for the right patient, and if done properly, the success rate there on the 90%. So we've gotten very good at making these procedures smaller, less invasive, more predictable um, to get people out of their back pain. 
So where do you think this field is going? What are you excited about as a spine surgeon uh, about future options for making people feel better? So I think a couple of exciting things happening. One is, can we intervene earlier before someone gets to a point where they need a bigger procedure uh, and have really terrible disabling back pain? So I think there are a number of technologies coming out where we can either stimulate and enhance the muscle function. There are probably better medications that we're coming up with that will alleviate pain much better with less side effects. And I think when we think surgery, it will become less and less invasive, where I think that the majority of what we do for low back pain uh, will probably become outpatient surgery and what people sort of call Band-Aid surgery, where you come in that morning, you may have a procedure, but you're home for dinner and you have a small dressing on your back. And that's pretty much it. So I think we're going to get to even more targeted and even smaller procedures uh, to get patients there. But hopefully we can avoid surgery altogether and intervene earlier on. And that's where I think um, some of the newer technologies are going to be helpful in targeting pain, targeting some of these structures, and and doing things with um, ability to strengthen and rehabilitate and get the muscle more functional without having um, to recur to actual surgery. So lots of neat things happening. You've inspired me to go back to the gym and uh, and work on my core. Uh, and so, so thank you for that. One last question for you. If our listeners are interested in learning more about the subjects that uh, we've been talking about, where would you direct them to get high quality information that they can rely on? So there are a couple of very good sites, depending on, uh, again, how much in depth someone wants to read or research back issues. I think the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons does a great job with general information. For those interested in digging deeper into the science, there are a number of good other academy websites. But I would also say that PubMed, which is um, available online free of charge, has lots of great articles. It's a little bit more advanced and, and requires a little bit of more scientific thinking to find specific articles. Every published article in our field pretty much is available online now uh, to anyone free of charge by going on to PubMed. Well, Frank, thank you so much for joining me today. Well, thank you for having me. I really appreciate it, Ira. Uh, My guest has been Dr. Frank Schwab. He is the chair of the Department of Orthopedic Surgery at Lenox Hill Hospital and an expert in orthopedic spine surgery. I also want to thank Katie Tam for researching this topic, our producer, Connor Pilkington, and our audio engineer, John Mullen. For more information about this program and to find past episodes, please visit medicine.hostra.edu. Slash well said. You can also subscribe to our free podcast wherever you get your podcasts. Our listeners are welcome to send comments, suggestions, and questions to well said at hofstra.edu. Until next time, I'm Dr. Ira Nash, and that's Well Said.